Good morning. We are pleased to have with us this morning the Right Reverend John Tarrant. He is the Bishop of South Dakota, our companion diocese. He's been here for convention that we have just finished, and he stayed over to preach with us. So I hope you all will greet him well, um, have a chance to talk to him afterwards, and uh, he's got a good message for us this morning. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Set us free, O God, from the bondage of our sins and give us the liberty of that abundant life which you have made known to us in your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Lord reminds the people that righteousness is about justice more than correct religious observance. Fasting and worship that is accompanied by oppression are not righteous or pleasing to God. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Shout out, do not hold back, lift up your voice like a trumpet. 
Announce to my people their rebellion, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet day after day they seek me and delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that practiced righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Why do we fast, but you do not see? Why humble ourselves, but you do not notice? Look, you serve your own interests on your fast day and oppress all your workers. Look, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to strike with a wicked fist. Such fasting as you do today will not make your voice heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose a day to humble oneself? Is it to bow down the head like a bulrush and to lie in sackcloth and ashes? Will you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free? and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover them and not to hide yourself from your own kin? Then your light shall break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help, and he will say, here I am. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom be like the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places, and make your bones strong, and you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water, whose waters never fail. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to live in. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. Descendants will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches will be in their house, and their righteousness will last forever. Alleluia. Happy are they who fear the Lord and have great delight in his commandments. Light shines in the darkness for the upright. The righteous are merciful and full of compassion. 
It is good for them to be generous in lending and to manage their affairs with justice. For there will never be shaken. The righteous will be kept in everlasting remembrance. They will not be afraid of any evil rumors. Their heart is right. They put their trust in the Lord. Alleluia. Happy are they who fear the Lord and have great delight in his commandments. Their heart is established and will not shrink until they see their desire upon their enemies. They have given freely to the poor, and their righteousness stands fast forever. They will hold up their head with honor. The wicked will see it and be angry. They will gnash their teeth and pine away. The desires of the wicked will perish. Alleluia! Happy are they who fear the Lord and have great delight in his commandments.
Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. It's good to be here this morning. My name is John Tarrant. I'm the uh, Bishop of the Diocese of South Dakota. Some of you may have heard me preach yesterday. Well, you're going to hear it again. <laughs> now, if I were a much more creative person, I would have had another sermon. But no one's ever accused me of that, so here we go. Uh, also, you know, I was so impressed that those of you who are at convention, you know, they. They really talked about scripture as the telling of story. And throughout convention, they had different uh, folks that had memorized the passages. And they not only spoke them from memory, but with uh, emphasis and, and joy and enthusiasm. And then the preacher comes with a bunch of notes. It's great to be here. Uh, it's, it's East, the Diocese of East Tennessee is a great joy. It's my third, yeah, third, third visit here over the past four plus years, um, and it's just uh, always a joy to come visit y'all. Um, now, see, I can say y'all. Um, I, I actually long have blamed Jimmy Carter for that. Uh, you know, four years of him in the White House, and I think half of America was saying y'all. But, um, but the truth be known, like many Americans, my roots are, are really spread throughout this country. My mother's people um, have roots in North Carolina, and then they migrated north to Missouri, to uh, the Kansas City area. That's why it's Missouri. If it were St. Louis area, it'd be Missouri. Um, but to Missouri, and my daddy's people's roots are in Louisiana. They migrated up to Kansas, uh, especially Atchison, and then Missouri, Kansas City area. And my mommy and daddy, they met and married in Jacksonville, Florida. <laughs> so, and then moved back to Kansas City area, and, and I'll, I'll give you the quick story. Moved back to the Kansas City area, and my daddy was transferred. He worked for General Motors, was transferred to Flint, Michigan, and that's really, I was about two years old, three years old at the time. That's really where I grew up. Um, and then went to seminary in Alexandria, Virginia, and somehow, God does have a sense of humor. I spent 23 years serving congregations in Massachusetts and Connecticut before God rescued me and sent me to South Dakota. And, 
Hey, now, hey, now, now, wait, wait. That was not supposed to be a funny line. <laughs> well, and then God really rescued me after four years serving the church out there, and God had me elected bishop. And I thought, dear Lord, I didn't think I was that great of a sinner. <laughs> the Diocese of South Dakota has 79 congregations, of which 54 are Native American. The population of South Dakota is about 9% Native American. By the way, it's, it's what uh, commonly is called the Sioux tribe. Um, they're Lakota, Dakota, Nakota, depending on the dialect. Um, the population of South Dakota is 9% Native American, but over 50, probably closer to about 60% of the Episcopalians in South Dakota are Native American. Um, I have as much or more contact with Native Americans in my ministry than I do Anglos. Uh, our churches, most of them, well, all of them actually have electricity. That's the good news. The bad news is many do not have running water or indoor plumbing. And that's the truth. Um, my suggestion always is uh, make sure you have a good outhouse. I mean, folks, it worked. It worked for folks a lot longer than indoor plumbing has worked for folks, right? <laughs> that's right. That's true. That's true, too. So, um, and, and most of them do have, I've, sometimes, not, not in the sermon, but sometimes I can tell you some stories about outhouses. <laughs> now, I'll bet you there aren't too many people that stood in this pulpit in the last 20 or 30 years that could tell you stories about outhouses. <laughs> many of our congregations operate on less than $2,000 in their annual budget a year, and some are much, much less. Some are really just cash flow congregations. The Sunday offering comes in, and they pay the electric bill. And if it's not enough, they don't pay the electric bill. And that's the reality. Um, I, I may have mentioned we have one Sudanese congregation in Sioux Falls. But I'm not here to tell you about South Dakota, although it did, would seem a little odd if I didn't tell you a little bit about it. So I have. Um, I really was asked, I, I believe, I believe the, the dean asked me to come here and preach the gospel. So, uh, God willing, I will do that. Um, you know, when the gospel writers took collections of stories and sayings and teachings and remembrance of Jesus, you know, they got them from different sources, and you know, probably most of us know all this. They, they put them together in a story form. Um, they put them together in a story form because that's really the way we remember things. So Matthew, as he sat down and put these together, the portion we read today from Scripture is really what is commonly called the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew put Jesus on a mount. Now, Jesus probably preached from a mount. We know he also preached from a field called a plain, but if you just say he preached from a plain, some people might have thought he was you know, flying over Boston or something, but he wasn't. He preached from a field, he preached from a boat, and he preached in many other settings. So today we're going to do a little exercise of using our creative imagination, and we're going to remember, actually this is, this is we're going to remember the truth. It is, it is truth. Um, is it facts? Who knows? But we're going to remember the truth. And a number of years ago, I had the opportunity of, of going to Israel and the, the Galilee region. And there is a portion where they believe that uh, Jesus preached often. There's a portion in Galilee along the sea, and, and it's really a lake. But there's only two, as you know, there's two large bodies of water in Israel. One is the Dead Sea, and the other is Galilee. So they don't have a lot of words to describe big, large bodies of water. So uh, they call, we call it sea translated, but it really was a big lake. And as you know, in, in big lakes, you know, it comes ashore and there's sort of a, 
a dirt or a sandy area, and then the grass begins. And so Jesus, on this particular day, Jesus is sitting on the edge of the grass by the shore. Can you picture it? And, and hopefully you can. You've all been probably near lakes, and he's sitting on that edge of the grassy area, and there's a slope that goes up. A slope, a grassy slope that goes up, and the folks are seated on the slope. And it, it creates a natural amphitheater. And it really does. Um, in fact, they had somebody go down and they either sang or they read something or something and we were up on that slope and it is, it's a natural amphitheater. And so the folks were there and, and on this particular day, the, the folks, the people, probably went about halfway to two thirds up this slope. And then, you know, uh, somebody said this is uh, being recorded or something, is that what you said? Yeah. Very unnerving, by the way. Just, <laughs> For the record, for the record, very unnerving. Um, so if, if I commit any heresies, <laughs> um, my plane leaves on Tuesday. <laughs> Actually, it leaves on Monday, but that way folks won't get me. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, that's right, that's being recorded too. Uh, <laughs> not a good day. Anyway, but in the days of Jesus, as you know, there weren't any recorders. There weren't any recorders. So if you wanted to make sure, and Jesus was kind of an upstart. really was. He was an upstart. And so if you wanted to know if these upstarts, there were other preachers in his day, these upstarts were, were committing heresy, you'd send some of the leaders would come out to listen. Right now, you know, there, there weren't any... I know it's hard to believe, there were not any recorders. So they come out and listen, and so, but you always knew who they were, you know? Sort of like secret service, you know? Um, you always knew who they were. And so, and, and uh, you know, I, I understand there's a reason why you folks are sitting in back, so I am not talking about you. Uh, for one thing, you're sitting. And see, what, what they were doing, you can imagine, you can imagine these guys, and they were guys, you can imagine these guys standing back there like this, with their arms folded. You know, when somebody's standing there like their arms folded, listening to you, eh, you might get in trouble pretty easily. Remember that. Really. I mean, you know, when folks are standing around like this, man, that's a problem. Um, so these guys standing back in the back of the crowd, if you can picture this on the hillside, with their arms folded. And ever so often they would, they would turn and they would mumble something to each other as Jesus talked. Oh yeah. And of course there were a few Roman soldiers because in those days at that place when two or three are gathered together there were soldiers present. And so that's the setting. That's the setting where where Jesus is preaching to these folks, most of them just simple folks, just simple folks, uneducated, many were poor, and they're sitting there, and the crowds are settled, and Jesus, Jesus looks at his disciples, they're right, kind of in the front there, folks behind him, looks at him, he begins to speak. He says, Blessed are the poor. Blessed. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek, the hungry, the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart, the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. And he pauses. And he looks, he looks into the faces of those who are on the hillside gathered, and he notices, he notices with many of them their tears in their eyes. The tears in the eyes because these people these people who had faced the heat of the day, these people whose lives were filled with hardship and struggle, these people could never remember 
having their lives referred to as blessed. They've never been called blessed before. And of course, the men standing in the back with their arms folded were shaking their heads because they thought this was absolutely ridiculous. These folks' lives weren't blessed. Our psalmist tells us that this morning. These folks' lives weren't blessed. And as Jesus glances up, he can see their faces. He can see the, the smug looks. It reminds him, as he looks at them standing in the back, it reminds him of exotic spices. You know exotic spices. Now, now this is prejudicial, okay? This is prejudicial. I'm not big on spices. You, you know, really, not, not fancy stuff. I don't know when all of a sudden everything had to have spices in it. Yeah, you know, that has nothing to do with this, but just as an editorial note, it does reflect my bias. But Jesus sees them standing back there, and he says, they're like exotic spices. Exotic spices, when you eat them, it tastes good. But soon, you have indigestion. <laughs> and maybe... The look on their faces looked like they had indigestion. Then, then he looks at his disciples who are right in front. He sees them, and then he looks at the folks who are seated just behind them. Wow. He says, you, but you, you are the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. The light of the world. Salt of the earth? How could these simple folks be the salt of the earth? Last year, just about this time, I went to see one of our Lakota laymen who was in the hospital in Rapid City. He's become a friend over the years. He had the lower part of his foot and the lower part of his leg amputated as a result of diabetes. Very common. Side note, I've never been anywhere where I've drove around the countryside and seen so many handicap ramps at houses. That tells you something. But Don had had his lower part of his leg amputated. Well, Don drives bus for a living. Well, of course, he couldn't school bus. He couldn't do that anymore. And he ranches. And while he was in the hospital recovering from this amputation, the person he had asked to feed his horses had accidentally poisoned them. And that's not enough. You know, we, the Bible study, uh, the dean, we talk, one of the passages you used was from Job. You know, and that's kind of like Job, if that's not enough. If that's not enough. If that's not enough, this was in January, if that's not enough, in April, I happened to be visiting Swanee. I got a phone call from him and his stepdaughter had been killed in an automobile accident. Now, folks, this isn't an exceptional story. I hear stories of a series of tragedy after tragedy after tragedy among people and in families every day. That same reservation that Don is from, the priest buried a husband and wife who had died of separate illnesses they died so close together, they just had one funeral. Over the years, 
Don has been a faithful, active member in the church. Every summer he goes to our summer camp, or most summers, he'll work outside fixing fences and doing some other outside repairs. Don was key to holding that mission. On Cheyenne River Mission, there are 10 congregations in an area just smaller than the state of Connecticut. There are 10 congregations. And Don did a wonderful job of holding them together um, by his presence. The campers at camp refer to him as Grandpa. He's now facing new challenges with amazing courage and hope. I want to tell you, he's got more courage than I'll ever have. More courage than I'll ever have. Now, just a few months ago, we hired him to be our camp facilities manager. We hired him to be our camp facilities manager, not because we feel bad for him, but we hired him because he is the salt of the earth. He's the soul of the earth. He is essential. No blips, no pretense, fully authentic. And no indigestion when you're around him. But I'll tell you, there's lots of flavor. Jesus, Jesus said to those gathered, you are the light of the world. These simple people, these simple people on that hillside, how could they be the light of the world? I attended, I've attended two funerals for adult children of one of our Native American deacons. I would discover at the second funeral that she had buried six children and her husband, all who had died as a result of tragic deaths. I mean, can you imagine that? She's an active deacon, so she's not elderly. Can you imagine burying six children? Now, my wife and I, 10 years ago, we had a daughter die of cancer. We know the deep grief of burying a child. But can you imagine burying six children and her husband? I'll tell you, when she, when she takes the gospel book and stands in the middle of her people and reads it, the stories, those familiar stories have light shown upon them. I am inspired by this woman who can bury so many close to her and still proclaim with conviction the gospel, the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. You are the light of the world. One more just quick story. December 2012, we had a group of young adults who went over to the European gathering uh, of Taze. And each year they have a, a winter gathering in some part of Europe. Last a year ago, last December, it was in Rome. And so we, we raised a bunch of money and we sent a group to Rome. Four of them were Native Americans. On New Year's Eve, one of the Native Americans, a young Lakota woman from Standing Rock Reservation, attired in her native dress, danced to her traditional music in the Basilica Santa Maria before a crowd of over 300 pilgrims from around Europe and the world. Quinetta, Quinetta said without words to those gathered, see, 
See, we're not just a bunch of poor, drunken Indians, as we often are portrayed. We are proud people with a rich culture and rich traditions. On that day, this courageous young Lakota woman dazzled Rome. She was indeed the light of the world, the salt of the earth. No bushel basket for her. As Jesus, as Jesus looked out at his followers, I believe, I really do, I believe he was inspired. You know, you don't think of yourselves doing that, do you? You know, you inspire God. That's true. Yeah, that's true. Do you know that, that God is thankful for you? See, we, we thank God all the time. We're, we're inspired by God. But, but you all, you inspire God, and God is thankful for you. That's true. And so as Jesus looked at his disciples, I think, I, I think he was inspired. But then, and I mentioned this yesterday, then something happens. We get in the inspiration and something happens at convention. I thought it was a real inspiring convention. I don't know how many of you were there, but I thought it was very inspiring. And I, I said to Bishop George, I said, lots of good energy. Well, you've got a good group of folks here. And then, you know what we do at the end? We always do this after we're inspired. Not, well, too often do it after we're inspired. We send around an evaluation. Yeah, you did something. We move from inspiration to evaluation. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> See. And usually we don't leave much time in between unless something happened to the inspiration. Well, I think that day, I think that day, as Jesus looked back at those guys standing like this, I think he could see the evaluation coming. And I think is what he saw in them is they were saying things like, well, what about the law of Moses? What about the prophets? You can't just dismiss our tradition. Our traditions are important, aren't they? Our traditions are important. That's what Episcopalians say all the time. Our traditions are important. And most of these folks, most of these common folks, they just really, come on, let's be honest. They just don't really measure up. You know, I, I can see, I can see the look of Jesus' face as he stares right back at him and says, you know, man, I got to tell you, I am a Bible-believing guy just like you. I told you, Joshua, I, I would hit it. Joshua told me that I could actually slap the pulpit with this group. Now I would tell you at 8 o'clock I would have never slapped the pulpit. <laughs> Jesus said, I'm a Bible-believing guy just like you. I haven't come to abolish the law and the prophets. I've come to fulfill it. Then he looked at the crowd. He looked at the crowd and he said, you know, unless if your, your righteousness exceeds those guys standing in the back with their arms folded, You'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Wow. So come, he always said this. He always, always, always said this. He said, then come, follow me. Follow me. Follow me, and, and I'll show you. I'll show you how to find the kingdom of God. I'll show you how to experience. God's kingdom. You see, the kingdom, the kingdom of God is not about believing. Not about believing. Oh, the institution would so much like to make it that. The kingdom is about following. The kingdom is about following Jesus. If you want to get to the kingdom, that's how you get there. You follow Jesus. The kingdom is not a destination. You know, 
I asked a group once, and, and uh, I can't remember what the reading was, but they said that, that really they, they just wanted to get to heaven. The kingdom isn't about getting to heaven. It's not a destination. It's a way. It is a way of life. And Jesus says, I'll show you what it is like to be a kingdom person. And then he does. And you know, if we had read, read on, and we can, of course, on Sunday morning, because despite the preacher, we are on a timeline. Um, I said this morning, I said, hey, like, you know, I, th- I think if we believe in uh, reincarnation, which we don't, just, I want you to know, the Bishop of South Dakota says we do not believe in reincarnation, so make sure that goes on record. But if we did, I would have been a Baptist preacher in another life. <laughs> And there's some folks in my diocese probably think I should be a Baptist preacher now. <laughs> but Jesus would go on. <clears throat> he would go on. And I'm not going to read the whole thing because actually this goes through. Now, Matthew did not have chapters, by the way. This goes through the end of chapter 7 and concludes, Now when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were stopped. So so remember, the crowds were astounded when he'd finished. When he finished saying things like, you know, anger and insult. Anger and insult, they corrupt relationships. You know that. When When we act out of anger or insult, they corrupt relationships. He says, be more concerned about what is right for the good of the community than what your rights are. Yeah, I believe he says that. I mean, it's transliteration, but, you know, I think he says that. He tells them to control their thoughts. Hmm. Control their thoughts, because in controlling their thoughts, it will help them control their actions. That's true, man. I could spin this off on a lot of things with that, but I won't. Control their thoughts because that will help you control your actions. He tells them that retaliation and retribution, retaliation and retribution take broken relationships and multiply the brokenness. Now tell me if that isn't true afterwards. Tell me if that isn't true. Retaliation and retribution just take broken relationships and multiply the brokenness, and people and families and nations bear witness to that truth. A kingdom person, he says, should turn the other cheek unless your righteousness exceeds that of the law and the prophets. A kingdom person should turn the other cheek. He goes on to say that we should love our enemies, love our enemies, and pray for those who persecute us. Do you do that? Do I do that? Love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. Unless your righteousness exceeds the law and the prophets, that's what he's talking about. He says, do not judge. Do not judge. That's God's job. God does that. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Well, it says a lot of other things. A lot of other things. And you know, many in the crowd, many in the crowd were beginning to understand beginning to understand that Jesus Jesus was not establishing a new law. He wasn't establishing a new law. But this is an invitation. It's an invitation to follow him. As you follow him, you discover 
the kingdom of God. I'll get it right today, Alex. Alex, yesterday, yeah, I think yesterday it was, was, Alex had a wonderful quote that I jotted down, Alex, the youth coordinator for the diocese. He said, and it was in a question form, he said, are you following the message of the gospel? You said that, right? Did you say that? Yeah, okay. Gotta take credit for it, gotta take blame. Are you following the message of the gospel or enforcing it? You said that, right? Yeah. Again, if you don't like it, it's Alex. <laughs> if you like it, I just have put it in creative form. Are you, are you following the message? And I think that's what Jesus was asking the crowd. The message of the gospel of the kingdom. Or are you enforcing it? Jesus came to say, this isn't about enforcement, folks. This is about following, about following, about following. Jesus invites us to follow him, to surrender our lives. He invites us to be transformed, to be salt and light. Know this, because this is also true. It is only through God's grace that salt is salt and light is light. And it is only by God's grace that you and I can live the kingdom vision. So I'll speak for myself. I accept the invitation to follow Jesus and discover the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. Creed. Um, we're going to omit today. So if you turn to page 388, form four, the prayers of the people in your book of common prayer. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant almighty God that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory to the world. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our guide the people of this land and all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly and in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. bless all those whose lives are closely linked with ours 
and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loved us. We give special thanksgivings today for the work and ministry of St. John's Library team, for the work and ministry of St. Francis Church in Ottawa, for the flowers in the chapel given to the glory of God and in memory of Dr. Frank Tipton Rogers, and for the flowers in the church given in memory of Lily and in honor of Hannah, Kate, Sadie, and Jack, and a special thanksgiving that there were no deaths from the soldiers this week. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, and spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them to the joy of your salvation. We especially pray for Betsy Corlew, Belle and Trudy Gardner, Michael Hankins, Don Horton, Martin Hunt, Kimberly Curtis, Wilson Madden, Michael Milner, Libby Reed, Sally Sanders, Jenny Scott, Bob Sullivan, Dan White, Bo Willian, Virginia Wallaford, Harriet Callie Calloway Cook, Chris Eastman, Barbara Gearing, Diane Goodman, Emma Jean McAgene, Lee Mabry, Leona Ray, and Bula Roof. Are there others? We pray for those who are serving our country in the military, especially those deployed in Afghanistan, as we pray for the civilians of Afghanistan and for all the victims of war. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. we commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them be fulfilled. And we pray that they may share with all the saints in your eternal kingdom. We pray for Eddie Goswick. Are there others? Lord, in your mercy. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and on earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The Confession of the People is found on page 360. And we pray together. Most merciful God, we, we confess that we have sin. sinned in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you as our heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins, for our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. And now let's stand and exchange the peace. And if you will, before you start, I know there are lots of visitors today. We've got the, the young adults and youth uh, working on the next happening. Welcome to you all. And we have some visitors from convention. So please greet each other. There come the ejection section back. Please greet each other with your names. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And I'll so with you. Peace. Good job. Thank you. Thank you.
just going to tell them to pick them up in the back of the church. Would you wait, Would you stand there and wave your hand though and say, David, love to meet you? That's an old tire. That's an old tire. That's fun. Please be seated. Well, since we had a self-confessed Baptist in the pulpit today, um, I will say, please come for the altar call, and it's at the altar rail. And um, our altar call, as the Baptists have told me, is communion. So please, if you're visiting today, join us at the altar rail for communion. And if you are visiting today, particularly um, as our guest, not already part of the Episcopal Church and kind of looking around, um, we've got a wonderful bag of some goodies, something really good to eat, and some good information. This is Dave Gone. He would love to talk to you. He will talk to you. He loves to talk. And he'll give you, a, he's not going to talk now, though. And he's going to give you some, uh, something good to eat. So uh, he'll see you in the back of the church when you leave today. So please grab a bag as you leave. Um, just a, a reminder, we have a wonderful recital tomorrow. Stay after the service for Cookie Minute, which is lovely. Um, we have some good healthy snacks for the kids as well, so please join us over there. And then a sad note, um, uh, one of our longtime parishioners, Jenny Jones, had a heart attack in the night and died this morning. Um, and, you know, she's been with us so long, and I was thinking about um, one of those stories of salt to the earth. And, you know, um, she always took her sewing machine for years, and I don't know if she's done this recently, and all the street people knew her because she would take her sewing machine and moved it in down at our volunteer ministry center at the very earliest days, and she would sew their clothes. Isn't that just a wonderful image? Anyway, we'll pray for Jenny today. We'll miss her. Um, she had one of those, I'm not sure about indigestion, but there were, she was wonderful. Um, she was a great person and a lot of energy and a lot of salt and light in her. And we'll celebrate her life later in the week. Please pay attention to our emails. We always send out a note when that will happen. And obviously, we'll need to contact and work with uh, all the stepkids. Gary Jones, who's an Episcopal priest, is one of those, so he'll probably be back with us. So we'll let you know when we'll celebrate her life later in the week. Okay? All right. Ascribe to the Lord the honor to his name. Bring offerings and come into his courts.
important reminder this morning with so many of you visiting with us, when you come to the altar rail, the um, ushers will keep a regular group of you coming forward. Please just fill in wherever there is space. I, I promise it works out in some fashion. We'll continue with the Great Thanksgiving, page 361. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your heart. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you. Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, because in the mystery of the Word made flesh, you have caused a new light to shine in our hearts, to give the knowledge of your glory in the face of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and light, heaven and earth are full of glory. Hosanna. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people, the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in Him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace, and at the last day bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say together, 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. the gifts of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. Go into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Fight the good fight of faith that you might finish your course with joy. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always.
Special thanks to our newest acolyte, Perrin Gentry, for her service today. And a reminder that there are guest bags in the back if you're visiting with us. And now let us go forth into the world to love and serve Christ. Thanks, Thanks be to God.